How do you solve a murder where a group of people is involved, where there is little or no evidence as to who inflicted the fatal blow and when no one is talking? Well, for years, the answer was found in the powerful legal doctrine known as joint enterprise, which allows entire groups of people to be prosecuted for murder, even though they may have had no role in the actual killing. But while there may be a value in allaying public fears of gang violence, it's absolutely imperative that juries are able to reach the right verdict and not the most popular or most convenient. The overarching principle of the criminal law should be to clearly identify conduct that warrants punishment for conduct that needs to be diminished in terms of society's well-being. It, it all basically started over an argument over a silly taxa. They said that Laura and them had pinched this man's taxa, so Laura and Michael went, oh, no problem, we'll get out. So as my daughter were getting out, one of these big guys threw Laura to the floor and it all started, this is how it all started from. Because there were like two stages to this fight. There were a fight where there was the, with the taxi, and then where the second part, well, where they went up to this house, but Laura wasn't in, she had nothing to do with this second part of the fight. But the, 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 they've classed the case as all one big fight. And I thought, you know, she'd get something like violent disorder or something like that. I never expected for one minute she'd get done for murder. The law of joint enterprise has been in existence for hundreds of years. In the 18th century, if someone was killed or seriously injured as the result of a duel, joint enterprise allowed the prosecution and conviction of not just the duelists, but also their supporters, seconds, and even the doctors who were standing by ready to attend to the wounded. And though this may have been an acceptable way of securing a conviction in the 18th century, in the 21st century, this catch-all doctrine is very out of time and out of place. Over the years, and predominantly in, re in recent years, because of the increase in gang violence or group violence, they've used this law to capture a whole group of people that it was never designed to capture. John Enterprise typically is used to prosecute large numbers of gang members, often teenagers or young people, uh, who are with the person who, for whatever reason, commits the crime uh, and are said to be playing various subordinate roles. But once you're hooked into a joint enterprise, you can also be liable for further offences, not because you've agreed that they be committed, but you've foreseen the possibility that they might be. Now, the reality is that the connection to that death is incredibly small. It could well be as small as you discussed committing the crime with someone who already wished to do it, and you said to them, okay, fine, do it. And then you weren't present, and you foresaw the risk that that other person might go just a little bit too far. Suddenly, you are being punished for exactly the same crime and could get exactly the same sentence as the person who did it. A concern I have is that if the prosecution are able to show an awareness that somebody had a knife or might have a knife, maybe it's possible to work back from that and say, well, if you foresaw that there might be a knife, you foresaw that it might be used, you therefore foresaw that it might be used to kill somebody, therefore you're guilty of murder. And I think there are some dangers in reasoning in that way. And the complexity of the trials, particularly involving gangs and the number of defendants, may mean that juries can easily fall into that trap. The law of joint enterprise is grossly unjust because it has developed into a form of liability that is so far removed from its original purpose that it no longer bears any of the traditional safeguards of English legal principle to ensure fairness to a defendant. You have to ask what the criminal law is doing. Are we focusing on the person who commits a crime? or broadening the net to include anyone that helps. Now, English law does both. It extends to anyone who helps, encourages, assists, many different words we could use. It actually makes it quite easy to convict that second person for their assistance. Joint enterprise within this scheme makes it even easier. If you have a very 
clear-cut case where somebody has restrained somebody so that that person can be stabbed. I think there you can say, you know, they have played a, a direct part in, in that crime. But if you have young people who are bystanders to an event and simply haven't stepped in to stop something, um, when a situation is developing and it may not be clear that somebody is actually going to die, um, I don't think it is fair to, to, to use joint enterprise in the way that it's currently being done and the law really needs to be looked at. The law of joint enterprise has so much uncertainty in it that it makes it difficult for the legal advisor to give clear advice about what will happen, which is what people always want to know. And I think it probably puts pressure on people who fear that they will be convicted of murder to plead guilty to manslaughter in marginal, probably defendable cases to avoid the risk of the much graver consequences of a murder conviction. Now that may or may not be an unspoken part of the policy behind the currently formulated doctrine. That is, to get more people to plead guilty to serious offences. But if it's done on the basis of legal uncertainty, then one might say that's an unsatisfactory basis for people to admit to the most serious crimes. Murder does cause particular problems in the context of joint enterprise liability, largely because of the sentencing for murder. The sentence is the mandatory life sentence that applies both to the principal and to the secondary. Now, if the secondary is convicted of another offence, for example, causing grievous bodily harm with intent in the course of a departure from a joint enterprise, the judge has a complete sentencing discretion and bearing in mind that the secondary is not directly involved in the commission of the harm, the judge would no doubt reduce the sentence accordingly. And the judge simply can't do that for murder because of the mandatory life sentence. That is the only sentence that can be imposed. Anthony got convicted under the joint enterprise rule because he was with a person the night another person got shot. When he had his Cody in the car with him, he said to Anthony, hang on here a minute, I won't be long. So Anthony said, OK. So he went round where this person lived and shot him. In the bloke's head room, he said, I just killed Ben Jarma. And um, my son closed his eyes and I think he thought of Evans because he thought he was next. And he got charged as joint venture um, or joint enterprise um, and he received a 30 year jail sentence. The rules of joint enterprise can be a necessary and proportionate um, tool for, for the law, um, but it really does depend on the way it's being used. And our concern at the Howard League is that increasingly it's being used um, in, in different ways, ways that it wasn't really originally intended to be used. Made up of lawyers and academics with a wide range of experience teaching law, practicing in the criminal courts, and supporting individuals adversely affected by the operation of joint enterprise liability, the Committee on the Reform of Joint Enterprise is convinced that this archaic law needs to be reformed as a matter of urgency, not just to make the law fairer, but also to make it more effective. Well, the effect of the law of joint enterprise is to, in practical terms, allow a prosecution to get a murder verdict in circumstances where there might be great uncertainty of evidence. A very real difficulty I've encountered in a, in a recent case was trying to explain to my client why he was on trial. He said, I wasn't there, I didn't see it, I didn't even know it had happened, why am I here? And it was very difficult for me do my best to explain to him why the law as it stands put him on trial. With Abid's case, there was a, they were charging him up first with the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. When the trial started, just about an hour beforehand, they changed it to murder. With him, he wasn't even anywhere near the murder, uh, where the murder took place. I didn't even know of the person who got murdered. But because he were friends with a few others, they got caught up in this joint enterprise. And the police, the way they 
put the case together, the picture they drew was like a gangland fight between two groups, which anybody in the area knows that that never happened. The real and legitimate aim of protecting the public from dangerous individuals who play a significant role in causing the death of a victim can only be served by rules relating to individual responsibility, causation and proportionate sentencing. For only by ensuring that criminals are convicted of those offences of which they can properly be said to be guilty can the wrong done to victims of crime be properly reflected. There are many problems with the law of joint enterprise and in order for it to be stated clearly in legislation so that the public knows what the law is, it must undergo a substantive review as a matter of urgency. At one point I thought the judges might be able to bring some sense to bear on this area but I think the problems are so entrenched the only solution is legislative reform. I think it would help if one thought about reclassifying homicide offences uh, so that the actual offence more closely mirrored the degree of involvement which the law said you had to have to make you culpable at all. At the moment we have two categories of murder and manslaughter which cover an enormous range of different sorts of behaviour and different degrees of culpability. Now one solution in the context of joint enterprise liability and murder concerns abolition of the mandatory life sentence. That would certainly resolve many of the problems. We would then have the person convicted as a secondary party to murder still being convicted of murder, but the judge would then have a discretion as to the sentence. But I think there are some other reforms that could be adopted, more specific ones. I think the most appropriate one would be to recognise a new form of liability for the secondary party who is a secondary party to murder. And that liability could either be called second degree murder or simply be manslaughter. And the advantage of either second degree murder or manslaughter is that the sentence would not be the mandatory life sentence. The judge would have a discretion. My opinion of the law of joint enterprise is that it's likely to capture people who have no intention of committing the crime for which they're charged and then ultimately prosecuted. Uh, and it is too wide in the way in which it is used to drag people who may have been at the scene uh, in order to find the person who committed the actual crime. I think it works a bit like a, a drift nest at sea, which once it's lowered in will catch all sorts of people. Uh, people that you don't want as much as those that you do want, people that you might not think are actually guilty of the offence. Joint enterprise is so broad that you don't have many options. You will be liable very easily. The potential for injustice in joint enterprise cases under the current law is great. It's understandable that the law should respond to increases in violence and danger to the public, but this must be within the established principles of justice. The law of joint enterprise is in a notorious state of disrepair. It's time for change. It's time for reform. <laughs>